pot room for one more bag? Sure, Mrs. Dinko, hop in. <laughs> Going off from our last review with Paddock, where the film was marketing itself towards a family audience, despite being very far from family friendly, <gasps> Mary and Max on surface level also seems to be potentially family friendly. Upbeat music, a child character as the main focus, and even a jolly narrator who is very reminiscent of the narrators you'd get in the old school kid shows. She adored the Noblets because everyone was brown. Oh no, shouted Rabbit, duck! And they all ducked, except Duck, who was wondering why Rabbit was shouting at him. But of course, being a film that's been recommended to me multiple times, it is definitely not going to be a kid's film. There are a lot of mature elements in this film throughout, and not subtle ones either, bundled in with some incredibly dark moments too. Like, we're talking dark. The film was produced in Australia and released in 2009, written and directed by Adam Elliott. The film's plot revolves around two unlikely pen pals from across the world, Mary, an 8 year old girl living in Australia, and Max, a 44 year old man living in America. Funny enough, the events that we see in this film are actually based on real life events from the director himself. Which, for the sake of spoilers, I won't get into until nearer the end of the video. So, let's take a look at the critically acclaimed film, Mary and Max. The film opens up in a town called Mount Waverley, set in Australia 1976. Here we get introduced to an 8 year old girl called Mary Daisy Dinkle. Mary Dinkle's eyes were the colour of muddy puddles, her birthmark the colour of poo. Unfortunately for Mary, her life at home isn't all too great. We see that the family doesn't have much money, as Mary has to make her own toys. And one of the reasons for this may be the fact that her mother is an alcoholic. Plus also the fact that her dad seems to have a low school job, working in a tea factory. He could get as many free tea bags as he wanted. But actually, I take it back. As a British person, that job sounds amazing. Mary's parents don't seem to have much time for her. Her father spends much of his home time in the shed pursuing his hobby of stuffing dead birds. Hey, everyone needs a hobby. And her mother is always busy testing the tea, as she puts it. He told Mary it was a type of tea for grown-ups that needed constant testing. God, it's like a less subtle version of Helga's mum from Hey Arnold. And on top of all that, it seems her parents never planned to have her in the first place. Her mother had told her she was an accident. How could someone be an accident? Don't worry, Professor. I was an accident too. Despite her life being far from perfect, Mary still tries to remain happy and optimistic, and this is reflected in the upbeat piano music we hear playing in the background, along with the enthusiastic narration being told over the top. Mary stopped daydreaming and went and fetched her pet rooster from the rain. The narrator is voiced by Barry Humphreys, who I think does a terrific job, which if it wasn't for all the mature visuals going on in the background, you would think you were actually watching a children's TV show. We then cut to America in New York City, where the soft warm sepia tone of Australia has been replaced by a more contrasting black and white, and the light hearted piano music replaced with a slower, almost kind of distorted tune. Here we get introduced to our other main character, Max, a 44 year old man who lives alone in his New York apartment. Possessing a dashing pair of Shrek like ears. Somebody wants to me. Max enjoys chocolate hot dogs, having logic and order in his life, and watching his favourite cartoon show, The Noblets. <laughs> what kind of grown adult still watches children's cartoons? What you'll notice after being introduced to these two characters is just how much the film changes in order to reflect their personalities. 
Mary's world is a soft brown, with upbeat music, and an inquisitive narration to reflect her childhood innocence. Whereas Max's world is darker, the music slower, and the narration, though keeping the same tone, does tend to focus much more on precise numbers when describing Max's life. It was the sixth fly he'd caught this evening. It had been six hours and twelve minutes since Henry VIII had passed away. Which will become more apparent as to why as the film goes on. We cut back to Mary and her mother who are out shopping, and while sat waiting for her mum to finish borrowing stuff, Mary looks through a New York phone book, and decides it would be fun to write a letter to a random person in America. And wouldn't you know it, the random person she selects just happens to be Max. What a coincidence. Later that night, Mary gets on writing her letter. She talks about her life, her favourite things, and poses the question of where do babies come from, as you do. Also, credit to the voice actress of Mary, as I think she does a fantastic job portraying the innocent and inquisitive nature of Mary. My favourite colour is brown, and my favourite food is sweetened condensed milk. As the letter reaches Max, we get more of an insight into his lifestyle. Seeing that he suffers from obesity, doesn't do too well romantically, and finds a lot of the world confusing. And then, did what he normally did whenever confronted with something new and stressful. Yep, I feel your pain, Max. After giving it much thought, Max finally decides to write back to Mary in what is a great little musical sequence. <laughs> In his letter, we learn that Max has seen a psychiatrist to help with his anxiety and obesity, no doubt brought on from his less than favourable childhood. She shot herself with my uncle's gun when I was six. Oh my! We also learn other things such as his previous job roles, his religious backgrounds, how he was once sectioned, and how he obsesses over cleaning up cigarette butts to prevent them from getting into the ocean. Butts are bad because they wash out to sea and fish smoke them and become nicotine dependent. Whoever sent this obviously has no idea about the physical limitations of life underwater. Well, might as well throw these in the fire. And of course, we get an answer to that ever important question of where do babies come from? If you aren't Jewish, they're laid by Catholic nuns. If you're an atheist, they're laid by dirty, lonely prostitutes. Again, credit has to be given to the voice actor playing Max, Philip Hoffman, who does an absolutely fantastic job. Who, sadly, five years after this film came out, died of a drug overdose in his apartment. Mary's mother discovers a letter from Max and isn't too pleased with the idea of her daughter writing to a middle-aged man from across the world, and so throws the letter out into the rubbish. Which, to be fair, I can actually kind of understand her concerns, especially considering some of the things written in the letter. And I will be completely honest here, when people told me about the basic plot of this film, and just how dark it gets, I was starting to get worried that it could go down a certain kind of dark path. But I will just get it out of the way now. It doesn't, so we can all breathe easy at least on that front. By pure chance, Mary manages to find the letter her mum threw out, and so continues writing to Max in secret. We find out more about how Mary's life isn't so great outside of the house either, as she is bullied by the other kids at school. Yesterday at school, Bernie Clifford weed on my spam sandwich. Honestly, Mary, if the spam in Australia is anything like the spam in the UK, that kid did you a favour. She is also teased about her birthmark on her forehead, how she doesn't have proper buttons on her coat, and even criticised by her teacher for not smiling enough. We also start to learn more about Max, including at how he feels lonely in life, his struggle with finding love, and how he recently got diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. Why are there hamburgers in your underwear? Oh my god! You're saying I have Asperger's? Which includes him taking things too literally. 
and having trouble recognising facial expressions. Despite these difficulties though, Max doesn't see himself as having a problem and doesn't like the idea of people saying that he needs to be cured. I do not feel disabled, defective, or a need to be cured. I like being an Aspie. Mary and Max's friendship grows over the years as they continue to write to each other, and whereas Max is comfortable with himself, Mary is not, and uses the money she had saved up to one day visit Max to instead have cosmetic surgery to remove the birthmark from her head. Things still don't go too great for Mary though, as she still embarrasses herself in front of her love interest, and also has both her parents die. But where God closes a door, a window is also opened, and Mary ends up getting married to her long found love interest and begins to succeed academically, where in honour of her pen pal Max, she devotes her life in trying to find a cure for Asperger's syndrome using Max as her case study. Her research is praised by her professors and even led to her publishing her own book. Thrilled at her achievements, Mary excitedly sends a copy of the books over to Max, in hope that he will be proud of what she's accomplished, stating that she will also give him half of the royalties and plans on visiting him next week. Max however, Mary. doesn't return the enthusiasm, well. not liking the idea that his condition is seen as a disease that needs to be cured. Emotionally Max outraged with feelings of betrayal, well. Max is unable to put his emotions into words, and so sends Mary a single item in the post, that item being the letter M from his typewriter, symbolising the end of their friendship. Now this is where things begin to get really dark. Distraught by Max's response to her book, Mary realises the error of her ways, and not only goes about destroying her literature, but also ends up turning to alcohol, soon becoming an apparition of her own mother. In an attempt to heal wounds, Mary sends Max a can of condensed milk with the words I'm sorry written on the side. Unfortunately though, she doesn't hear anything back, causing her life to spiral into further turmoil, eventually leading to her husband leaving her. This then gives us what I would argue to be the darkest scene in the film, as Mary is in her living room, heavily intoxicated, barely able to stand, and getting ready to take an overdose to then hang herself. Holy shit. But the thing about this scene, despite how dark it is, is that it's absolutely fantastic and probably my favourite scene in the entire film. As Mary takes the pills, we see the room melt around her as she carefree dances in her last moments of life. The way the camera pans around her whilst images of her past are showcased is basically showing her life flashing before her eyes, and the way she stares up towards the living room light, a visual representation of her stepping into the light, is absolutely brilliant. All the while we have this beautiful rendition of K Sera Sera playing in the background. Oh and uh, just to add on top of all that, she's also pregnant. Yeah, because this scene wasn't dark enough already. But just before it's too late, there is a knock at the door and a neighbour presents her a parcel that was left outside. The parcel of course, being from Max who along with a gift of his Noblet collection, states in a letter that he forgives her, in what is actually a very heartwarming speech. You are my best friend. You are my only friend. So Mary is saved, their friendship is restored, so all is good and happy, right? Well, not quite. So one year passes, and Mary has finally gotten round to visiting Max in New York, along with her newly born child. After all these years of waiting, and after numerous delays and obstacles, 
she finally gets to meet her lifelong pen pal in the flesh. But unfortunately, it seems that Max had passed away that very morning. Good lord this scene hits like a brick. Mary's reaction, plus the music that plays over the top, is just gut wrenching. But despite the immediate sadness, it's actually a very bittersweet moment. As Mary looks round, she sees all of the items Max has collected of their friendship over the years, showing the value it had on him. And in the final shot, we get a look up towards the ceiling, where we see Max had kept all the letters that Mary had sent to him, which he had stared at in his final moments of life, where he just sat there and smiled. And that was Mary and Max. Boy, what an emotional roller coaster. There's no doubt that this is a pretty dark film, not only with its elements of alcoholism, neglect, and suicide, but it also has a lot of black comedy too. Some of which you do kind of feel guilty laughing at. Despite how dark the film can get though, the message it holds is actually pretty upbeat and wholesome. The main theme of the film revolves around imperfections and being able to accept yourself. Max, for example, despite being told by everyone that he's different, is perfectly fine with that and accepts himself for who he is. So much so that there's a point in the film where Max actually wins the lottery. Oh yeah, did I not mention that? Well, it's because it literally has no impact on the plot whatsoever. But where everyone else spends the money on cosmetic items of beauty, Max simply uses the money to buy the things he enjoys, and nothing changes in his lifestyle. When Mary uses her money to try and remove her imperfection, she thinks it will make her happy, but ultimately it doesn't. Now I mentioned earlier how this film was based on true events, and it turns out the inspiration for this film was actually from a pen pal the director of the film had as he was growing up. Like Mary, he wrote to a guy who was living in the States. And like Max, the guy he was writing to also possessed Asperger's syndrome. Fortunately, however, that is where the similarities end. As unlike how Max detested Mary's book, the director's pen pal actually really enjoyed the film. No, he's, he's been very supportive and he's read the script and he knew we've been very transparent with him right from day one. And more fortunately, of course, is that the director's pen pal is still alive. Looking at the animation, the film's stop motion is pretty good. Though I don't think the stop motion is quite up there with the Isle of Dogs and Coraline, it's still well done. And some of the shots where we get slow pans of the environment offer a nice live action cinematic feel. I also love the stylistic appearances the worlds and the characters have, with each individual seem to have their own unique caricature, which again, I think plays into the theme that everyone has their imperfections. As for the colour palette, in an interview the director stated that through his memories, he always remembered 70s Australia as having a lot of brown to it, which I guess explains the brown. But I think the difference in colour also highlights the two separate worlds our characters live in, and a more subtle visual as to how their two worlds will never meet. There's also this thing where everything red still shows up in colour, kind of like the little girl in Schindler's List. I assume this is to signify importance of objects, like the connection these two characters have, such as the red post box, and Max's pom pom he received from Mary. But then it also seems to be the colour of the creepy lady's red lipstick, and also the character's tongues in general. So I'm not really 100% sure. Now onto the music. As mentioned before, I love the soundtrack to this film. The musical score fits perfectly with how the character on screen is feeling at the time. I mentioned before how each character has their own theme, but we also get these great musical moments such as Max's excitement when he first writes a letter to Mary, his shock realisation as he wins the lottery, and of course, the K Sera Sera rendition in Mary's attempted suicide. Now if I was going to give some negatives to the film, 
it would be that certain parts do feel like they drag a bit. Mainly the parts with Max talking about his life. I just think these scenes go on for a little bit too long and could have been trimmed down to keep the pace of the story up. Overall though, I would recommend checking out Mary and Max as it offers a lot of emotion, some great dark comedy, teaches the value of friendship and the ability of self acceptance. And during these times of isolation, I think it's more important than ever to realize the importance of self acceptance. Warts and all. And now we don't get to choose our warts. They are a part of us and we have to live with them. We can, however, choose our friends. And I am glad I have chosen you. <laughs>